Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on our second Arts Fest Online event of the day. In this hour we will be listening to Lisa Blower and RM Francis talking about their work and recent publications and we'll be lucky enough to hear them both give readings from their books. Welcome both, over to you Lisa. Hello, thank you for having us. Um, so, um, Rob and I have uh, worked together only since uh, November last year, wasn't it, Rob? When I joined yes. Wolverhampton University and the uh, Creative and Professional Writing Department. Um, and because we're both Midlands-based writers, writing about the Midlands, the Midlands often being our starting point, um, we share a lot of common ground, don't we, in terms of our inspiration, our fictional origins, um, our writing styles, uh, our subject matter. And so we thought it would be a good idea uh, to do a double header today uh, for both of us to share the screen and tell you a little bit about what we write. Um, and mainly because we've also both got novels out. We've both got not lockdown novels. <laughs> Um, it's uh, my second novel, Pondweed, uh, which is uh, out with Myriad Editions. It's a hardback. It's a, a lovely thing. and I'm very proud of it. And Rob, this is your first novel. Is that correct? That is my debut novel with uh, Wild Press Books. And you're going to kick off things, aren't you, um, by telling us a little bit about um, the, the lovely Bella and where it all came from, how it all began, because it's a deep-rooted black country myth story, isn't it? Um, that's, uh, it, it's a really fabulous book, actually. I finished it last night. Um, and so you're going to give us a reading, and then you and I are going to have a chat about that. And then for my sins, I'm going to share a little bit about Pondweed, and then we're going to natter about our work a little bit more, and then hopefully there's some questions to end. So over to you, Rob. Thanks very much. Yeah, so uh, this is Bella, uh, my debut novel, as Lisa said, um, and it's out with Wild Press Books. Um, and it's inspired, as Lisa said, by uh, one of the, the great myths of the black country. And it's appropriate that we should be doing this today because it's Black Country Day as well. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so for those that don't know the Bella mystery, um, at the back end of the Second World War, a group of, uh, a group of scouts went hunting for eggs uh, up Witchbury Hill, uh, just on the outskirts of Hales Owen and Stourbridge. And uh, they, uh, they found in their hunting a um, the skeletal remains of a woman in the hulk of a tree. And a few other odd things found along the way, like only one shoe and her face was, uh, her, her jawbone was broken and there appeared to be some kind of cloth uh, put down her throat. Um, and to this day, no one has ever figured out who she was, why she was there and who killed her. But around the same time and for decades afterwards, graffiti started to appear around the region saying, who put Bella down the witch elm and I know who put Bella down the witch elm and every now and then you can still spot these bits of graffiti across the region as well. So I've kind of taken this as my starting point for, for the novel and used that as a sort of anchoring device for thinking about how people think about community and identity um, and how they, they find a sense of self. Uh, through the kind of stories that we tell each other about place. Um, and uh, that's, that's my introduction done. I'm going to give you a bit of a reading uh, from the opening section of the novel as well. Um, and this is in the voice of, well, I suppose my main character, Michelle. I don't believe in witches or ghosts or whatnot, but there was something about Saltwells and Bella in one form or another. It was always there. Tim said he, well, he was an atheist, but he still day walk under ladders and he hated black cats. It's the same with Bella. Even if you think it's just a story, you still don't want to test it. Tim said he knew what happened. I needed to know. I remember driving up from the Delft towards Cradley and we were stopped at the lights atop a quarry bunk. Tony was with me and he pointed it out. It's a crossroads here and it's all concrete, brick, tarmac. It's grey, cold and stony. 
Back in the day, they'd met nails and chains if you went down one road, and they'd met glass if you turned around. Most of that had died out, so it was just a shadow of a place, a junction just to get to somewhere else. The lights at Quarry Bank come four ways with three lanes at each opening. It's busy with people heading to the shops to work. It's always busy and you never get across. You've always got to wait. It ain't nothing set to border between a couple of places that ain't proper towns any road. Tony was with me and he said it. See, round here we're always looking back when built from what come before us. Chains, steel, nails, soot and smoke in the skies. Most of it's gone now. We still got red bricks and concrete, corrugated metal and all that. But we ain't got forges. We ain't got mystic blacksmiths. We've got almost barren high streets. We've got slit glass, brass and plastic we've all over the works with. Stocking rows of dead-headed credit controllers, PPI reps, re retail consultants. We've got Merry Hill, an indoor town that spreads out in sanitised pound zones. Then there's what's left over, little dry suburbs that sink between hills where dead-headed factories and wrapped in weeds and big housing estates all wet and grey and punctured in electric light. Them no-go zones unless you're from there. Each zone has its own half-deserted labour club, its own brand of menacing team, its own bit of cut or brook or strange patch of green land that mopes between a terrace row and the mechanics. Tony was with me and he said it. Poking out through a crack in the curb was a thin green vine, and on the vine were tiny green tomatoes. Tony said it was like Detroit, how it was once the biggest industrial hub in the US, how nature had started to claim back the city, now it had run its course. There was something frightening about that. It come out of the ground, that's what they're meant to do. But the ground was meant to be controlled by us, not weeds. I wondered what else was lurking under our industry, waiting to come back. It made me think of salt wells and where we'd play when we was kids. Who put Bella down the witch elm? It was everywhere, this tag, chalked up over the red and grey bricks of our estate. This question, this warning, most of us got used to it. Just walked past the signs on the Renner, down Cinder Bank or Lodge Hill, like it was just another daily blot on a daily blotted place. Bella was a wench who'd been found in salt wells one night, it was. It was dead, just bones had been stashed there donkeys ago, and no one had ever found out how. So a bunch of them had started painting up on all the, the walls of the old factories, who put Bella down the witch elm. When I say donkeys ago, I mean before the steelworks closed, and before buses stopped coming through, and before job shop queues. It wasn't on our hour lot. It was before they'd built houses on the Sledmere. Nan said it went back to when they was kids in the 50s. Some of them, the old uns in Turners, would say it was saft. Just a local story dads had used to shut the kids up. But some of them, some said it happened just like the story said. After a night of supping in the pub, one of them old sorts boatmen and tinkers used. Not like the Turners or the Ope, where we'd sink shit-tasting shots and bark along to karaoke tracks. An old one like Pardo's with wood and brass and open fires. Bella had had a fill and stumbled home. I must have got lost or because I ended up facing the wrong way in salt wells, and maybe it was followed, and maybe it pissed someone off, or maybe I fancied one of the scrap men or something, because I wore alone. Whoever had been there and whatever they'd been there, we don't know. We just know they'd fucked her, took a stone or something to a yed and cut her up. Years later, a few kids from Derby End Scouts had gone out tracking or something. They'd looked inside this big old tree, a witch elm is still there too. Most of Salt Wells is thin, light-coloured trees and bushes. There's big ones too, but not like, not like the Witch Elm. Most of Salt Wells is paths, and it would have been back in the 50s, I reckon. You can follow the paths down the quarry and through the bluebells, and you wouldn't have thought you were still in Netherton, with all the greens and browns and the almost quiet. You gotta know where to find the Witch Elm. It's out on the paths. You cut through a thicket up by where it meets the res, and you follow the skinny roots met out of the bits of broken ground made by the few broken sorts who went looking. The wish elm sort of sits in a circle where nothing else grows around it. It's made tall, it's fat, it's dark and leafless and brittle and it's got a big laceration down the front. That's where they found her. Them scouts looked inside and pulled out a cracked up skull. Then the police found bits of old shoes and cloth and a few of the bones around the circle of ground. 
but it had been too long and no one knew who'd been there or why or nothing. So the funny fuckers around here started writing who put Bella down the witch elm on all the walls. I don't even know where the name Bella comes from. I guess under our skin too, Bella does. Like the tomatoes finding roots in cracked concrete. Thank you. <laughs> that was brilliant. Do you know what? Um... Cunnan Jones, um, a, a wonderful Welsh writer. Do you know Cunnan Jones? He wrote Cove and Dig, and um, he um, writes very, very minimalist fiction, uh, minimalist mm. novellas. Um, and he always says that he writes not to be read aloud. Um, okay. But I think when you write in dialect, um, and particularly like, you know, just listening to you then, you, it, that dialect and that voice performance absolutely brings the text alive um and you know so do you think it, that when you write in dialect it's really important often to kind of perform that work to orientate the reader um or do you think that because i mean this whole book itself is in this read this wonderful regional dialect isn't it yeah. um and so were you at, were you ever mindful that a, you know it might feel disorientating to a reader or were you quite belligerent about the whole thing <laughs> being written that way? Yeah, I, I was belligerent about it right from the <laughs> word go. I mean, yeah. I, I knew I knew it. Uh, that that was one of the the starting points for me that the, the novel had to be written in in Black Country dialect and it had to be mm -hmm. written in thick Black Country dialect. Um, and when I sort of look back at it now, um, when I talk about it in these ways, I. I like to think of it as a sort of textual version of a pub conversation. Yeah. And yeah, yeah so I like to think of it in that way. So ev everything's written in that kind of first person, repetitive almost. Uh, yeah. The rhythm had to be uh, bang on for me. And I suppose quite a lot of that comes from sort of starting with poetry, really. Yeah. And then moving into being a novelist. Um, yeah where the, the attention is always on the rhythm and the musicality of the lines. Yeah, because you do, I mean, that's the, capturing dialect. You have to um, almost do it really authentically for it to work, don't you? And so all those sort of kind of rep repetitions, those idiosyncrasies, those um, phrases or sayings that are, are really uh, embedded within that area that nobody will understand. Do, do you know what I mean? It's like my short story collection being called It's Gone Dark Over Bill's Mothers, which is yeah. a Stoke saying for it looks like rain. And, you know, it, you know, Know when you just feel really adamant about using that kind of stuff because it's it's so genuine and so sincere and it's really important to the story but do you feel sometimes that when you're writing in dialect that there's an underlying polemic to it for some reason it, it often feels like a political objective as well um i think it is yeah i mean i, I think for me it was important to give uh really um deep and intelligent thoughts and actions mm. in a voice that is generally considered to be, uh, well, by quite a lot of the UK at least, uh, dumb mm. um, uh, and parochial. Yeah. Um, where, and, and that's really not my experience of the kind of working class cultures of, of the black country, that they're full of wit and, uh, uh, and really, uh, often vulgar but but always clever <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with a bit of vulgarity i think a bit of honest vulgarity. <laughs> absolutely but i mean how did you manage it because one of the things i was um you know i really loved about it is that it's multiple narrators which is always really difficult uh to manage to manage a, a plethora of voices and we were talking about this yesterday and you, you couldn't even remember how many voices you had in this you were like was there seven was there 13 i mean how do you manage all that in that dialect and still be able to differentiate through you know each voice which you've done so admirably that's nice of you to say so i'm, I'm glad that landed yeah. but it took a hell of a lot of hard work i have to say and i'm, I'm indebted to my editors in yeah. lots of ways um yes. you know it, it a lot of that was tidied up with the that really nice collaborative experiences of, of working with an editor and yeah. other readers um do you find there was gender differences because i often find that your male 
characters were a bit more rough and ready with their voices. Okay. I mean, was that conscious? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, it, it, um, maybe the male characters are a bit more uh, straight to the point. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, but no, it, it, it wasn't really a, a, you know, I mean, writers tend to say this quite a lot, don't they? But th there was a sense that once I'd started forming these characters, they just did their own thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And got yeah. Them. Outside of outside of the kind of politics involved in using an everyday voice or everyday voices in a dialect sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't think certainly not consciously about yeah. uh, and it's, it's really important isn't it about capturing these everyday voices I get asked about it a lot um mm. and you know I, I always say that I you know I'm a massive fan of Alan Bennett you know I will I'll stalk him right. to the day he dies um and what I always loved about Talking Heads which is you know the, the book that really changed my life and always made me want to become a writer um, that he wrote stories about people for whom life generally happened elsewhere. Um, and I really love that quote because I think that sums up the kind of writing that I always want to, you know, the stories that I want to write about. How much does that lend to your own work? Um, well, Alan Bennett's another massive influence on me as well. Mm, um, I'll fight you for him. <laughs> and, you know, in these, I mean, there's a way of looking at Bella and, and seeing it as a series of monologues as well. Yeah, I thought that, yeah. Fine. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Is I, that I how you wrote it? a way of managing the, the multi-perspective yeah. of it. Is that how you wrote it then? Because, did, I mean, you know, how you, when you're writing from a structural perspective, um, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, there's some students uh, listening to us and, you know, so that kind of novel writing process and how we structure our novels. How... how how did you go about that? How much of that process of all these multiple voices and, and where they all went and, and, and how it kind of flowed for you? How, you know, what was all your thought process behind that? Um, it's a really good question. Um, originally, in its, in its earlier draft, it was all one long conversation that constantly flitted between different characters. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. in, in, the, in the way that I've sort of said about it being a kind of textual pub conversation. It yeah. was as if you were, e the reader was eavesdropping on other people's conversations. Yeah. There was no, there, there was very little marking as to when voices changed and who was saying what. Yeah. Uh, so it became necessary from a accessibility point of view, really. Yeah. To, yeah. To have but it as just... blocks of people so... telling separate uh lines of the tale yeah and you know as as um as much as that this book for me has like one foot in social realism and then one foot in magical realism you know i mean okay. um I, again I, I i think that's quite amazing because we again we were we were sort of talking about how our work and and this sense of place that we often have in our work our work and the fact that it's matters of deindustrialization that seems to influence us. It's always in that kind of backdrop, isn't it? It's like a backcloth to what we write about. Um, exactly. hi, I mean, how much, I'm gonna read back to you what you wrote on uh, page five. I wondered what else was lurking under our industry, waiting to come back. Um, yeah. You know, how, how do you do that in your work? You know, does it just kind of manifest or is it really intentional? Um. It's intentional, I, I suppose. I mean, the first thing I need to say really is that I'm indebted to one of my biggest influences, Joel Lane, the, the weird fiction writer that wrote so many great pieces oh, okay. based in Birmingham and the black country, yeah. uh, who's sadly no longer with us. Um, but I think of myself as a place writer to start That's with. So and yeah. so I, I, when you do that as a writer, I think when you approach the setting and the, the, the lay of the land of the story world mm. as a character in their own right and you try and embed that place and imbibe that place with as much symbolism as possible mm. and the black country and well the, the industrial or post-industrial west midlands is ripe for that because mm. it's got all that kind of industrial heritage that's now in ruin quite a lot of that is now being overtaken by really beautiful and diverse 
uh, wildlife. Um, and so uh, it's, it, it becomes this kind of symbolic, what I like to call a symbolically charged space. And mm. from there, the action comes out of that compost. Yeah, yeah. That, and I, yeah. I, see, I see very similar things happening with your work as well, Lisa, you know. Uh, I, I suppose the, the slight change, especially in your, in your latest work, Mm. Uh, and a, maybe your short story collection and, and pondweed is um, is about getting out of place or returning to place. So, although it's got that sort of charge to the locations, mm. it's mm. about it's as much about travel and transition as, as yeah. it is about being rooted, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I. I, I very much like you would think of myself as a place writer and yet I you know if I had a pound for every time I get labeled as a working class writer um and but you know when you write about places like Stoke-on-Trent where I'm from and you write about you know the black country where you're from people automatically label it for, for, as a class story um yeah. and so place and class become you know invariably in you know so sort of interconnected in a way and um i mean how do you feel about that it, you know because your voices of you know do come across to me as incredibly class-based voices um but would you say that this was a class but you know a class-oriented story it was it did have that class centricity to it yeah I'm, i think so yeah um it's 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 in the voices of the working class, yeah, no doubt. It's and 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 quite a traditional working class as well. Quite a traditional white uh, industrial or and and black country working class, um, where yeah, yeah. so much of the social life is in pubs and at work or um, mm. in those kind of off kilter places as teenagers of this kind of environment. Uh, yeah. go to investigate as well so it, it, there's definitely a, a class at the heart of it it's a, it's a, it's a story of, in lots of ways about um, a, a community a working class community that are, that are struggling to find themselves um, um, kind of post Thatcherite uh, yeah the dismantlement of, um, of industry yeah. I think that's particularly pertinent to places like Stoke and Teesside. Oh, my word. I mean, it, it, we, we not... think so much of our heritage and our mm. sense of self on those, but it's all in ruin. Yeah. But but at the same, you know, it's it's not so much it's the actual closure of you know for us the pot banks the pits. Yeah. Um, it's you know not necessarily the deindustrialization itself. It's more the disenfranchisement of communities, um, because you know it was those really strong class communities with all those kind of work, traditional working class values, and once you take away the industry that define those people, mm. you've got people who are you know the, the mass unemployment of people looking for work and that's when you get that social transience and um what i've kind of become quite interested in my fiction is what happens to those people when they've got nowhere to go or they're yes. too afraid to leave um but they feel then really displaced by their roots um and i mean how much of you as a writer i mean you know you born in the black country moved away but you've come back i i've not made it back to stoke <laughs> yeah. But yet, you know, it, it's amazing how much these, er, you know, those earlier years have had such formative impact upon our writing selves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what else to add to that, really. Yeah, yeah. You're, I mean, you're spot on with your observations. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, I find it very interesting. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting, uh, uh, there are there have been other writers, and Liz Berry has said similar things to this as well. That uh, getting away from the black country and then returning with yeah. sort of fresh eyes has been very, very useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I definitely, you know, although I loved growing up here up until about the age of sort of fourteen, from then on, I started in, until I was about twenty-five. I thought that absolutely anything interesting that happens happens elsewhere and I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah it's uh it's i know i mean i, I honestly i i think it's um the, the, it's a cracking book and one of the things i really love about this book as well is the fact that you've got all these graffiti tags all the way through it and mm -hmm. and we are living aren't we in the year of the slogan uh you know and and it's and it really made me think if uh you know there would be hashtag who put bella in the witch helm uh, you, do you know what i mean because it is yeah. that that isn't it you know um but um, why that story, Rob? Because it seemed that story itself has had a bit of a renaissance, hasn't it, just recently? Um, Nellie Cole's yes. po poetry book, you writing this, I, it's something that, it's a story I've not known about, and then all of a sudden I've seen loads of stories about it. Um, but why that story? Well, um, I remember to, there's, a, there's a really great electronic band uh, from, from the region called Agents of Evolution do really cool sort of uh, faux 1960s sci-fi movie soundtrack oh, right, right, kind okay. of thing. Yeah. Um, and they do a musical version of Bella. And I remember talking to them after a gig saying, oh, I'm writing a novel about Bella at the moment. And they went, yeah, we were going to do a whole symphony, but then we realised any, absolutely everybody that's come from the Midlands writes something about Bella. Uh, yeah. And at first I was really kind of put back thinking, oh God, I, maybe I should just put the brakes on this. And then I thought, well, what I'm doing here is just adding to uh, the already existing myth in the same way that many, many poets and writers have done with uh, King Arthur and yeah. Homer, uh, you know, and, and, and all that. Um, but for me, it was, it was the open-endedness that really got me. So the, the two okay. things that really kind of brought the, brought the novel into existence was starting with place, and those yep. edge lands of the black country. And then yeah. finding the story that itself is borderless. Yeah, yeah. And, and no one really knows where it begins and ends, just like the mm. place itself. Sort of seemed like a perfect fit. Mm. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's those kind of like folk tales, isn't it? And um, the myths and legends and stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, my P Pondweed is, is not, it doesn't have anything like that, but it, it, it was based on a, it, a family story, yes. a myth what story. Down is one of my questions. You stole one of my questions. Blair. Oh, I'm sorry. What was, what was you could go on? Tell me the question formally <laughs> then. And <laughs> be around, well, you've introduced it already. I'm now going to have to repeat, repeat yourself that, at the root of mine is this kind of yeah. story that kind of changes depending on who says it. Yeah. Very similar to kind of family or communal memories and, and ideas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is one of the seeds of Pondweed, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's based on my great granny Gladys, who was standing at the bus stop in a, a little town called Wem, which is about 10 miles out of Shrewsbury. And she gets talking to this elderly guy and it turns out that it's her childhood sweetheart that she thought was lost to the First World War. And she's in her 80s and so is he and they've not seen each other for uh, 65 years, getting them 65 years. Anyway, they get talking and he'd lost, he'd lost a leg. He was incredibly immobile and he said, oh, I'm, I'm looking for a cleaner. I'm looking for a housekeeper. And my granny Gladys, despite the fact that she was 83 and had worked in service for the fair proportion of her life, says, tell you what, I'll move in and I'll be your housekeeper. So she did. And then because they got really worried that folk were going to start talking about them, they got married. And I just love that story. And, it, and it's one of those that we all talk about when we all get together. Um, you know, just the, the, the happenstance of it, the, the coincidence of it, was it fate? Were they meant to come back together? Um, and if I ever tell that story, everybody always goes, oh, isn't it romantic? <laughs> just, you know, and I just, but I just think they must have had a real deep connection between them for them to you know kind of want to spend the rest of their lives to live out the rest of their lives together i mean they live together for the next i think it's 12 years or something they both wow. lived into their 90s um so yes that was the origin of the story i always wanted to write something about that love in later life and this kind of happenstance meeting and at the time i was commuting to Bangor, um to Bangor university where i was where i was before wolverhampton and so my commute was the A483, the A55. So I followed a lot of caravans. Um, and I started to become quite obsessed with all these caravans because 
uh, a they drive really slowly and hold you up <laughs> and b um, i always kind of think where are you all going <laughs> you know where's your destination quite often they've got very funky names as well caravans they've got like they do it's the names but also names? yeah and pimped up pimped up caravans you know people in pimped up caravans and so i started to think about this old this couple in later life and and running off in a caravan um and then um i was in a garden center with my daughter and it's a garden center where they have like fish tanks and uh, she she goes she loves to go to the soft play and then go and say hello to the fish and we were looking at these fish this one day and i overheard somebody selling a garden pond to somebody and i was absolutely mesmerized i i, I just was kind of thinking crikey this hadn't even occurred to me you know that there were pond supply salespeople who who sold products like this um and i went home and i started to reread death of a salesman which is one of my favorite plays yeah. uh with willie loman i love willie loman that he's one of the most tragic characters and so pondweed started to manifest um so it shall i shall i read uh, yeah please do shall i read because um I, I know time's ticking on and you and i are just nattering away um so i'm going to read from the beginning of my novel pondweed uh, I should show it <laughs> out with myriad editions um, and this is when Ginny and Selwyn my two protagonists um, reunite in later life so this is my version if you like of my granny Gladys meeting Charlie we all whimper at the faint whiff of romance yet it is such a grub I met Selwyn Robbie in the garden center Almost 50 years had lumbered by since we parted ways and then he was right there in the aquatics franchise selling garden ponds. I heard him before I saw him. He was talking intently to a couple about pond liners as if they might repair a doomed marriage. The most durable in the world with a lifetime guarantee, he was saying. And there it still was that Welsh border's accent with its fat and thick vowels that used to soothe my mother like a dose of laudanum. And no doubt doing that thing he used to do where he pinches his nostrils together and sniffs. This is top quality Swedish brutal rubber, 100% watertight, even in swell. For the size they wanted, because you must consider the edging excess for the expansion during the water fill, this particular liner was going to set them back 85.99 a square metre, and this was apparently without underlay, which was going to cost them another 50 quid per square metre if they went with the tight mesh he was recommending with hand-sewn trims. The couple looked as if they were having to share their lottery win with a family they despised. This was a little out of budget for them. They were only in a retirement new build with a lawn the size of a postage stamp. Not that this mattered to Selwyn, he patted on. Told them that the Swedish buttle rubber comes with its own ecosystem, assuring an ecological balance that would filter rainwater and siphon off the right nutrients as it would with any uneaten fish food. It's the effect of a million tiny teeth chewing on algae, he said solemnly, on my mother's grave. You'll never find a suffocated fish if you line with this beautiful tarp. Impatience had got the better of me. I'm the same with sweets. I'm a cruncher, not a sucker. And I'd inch myself forward to see who he'd become. Yes, I thought it could only be you. You from next door who'd count my hiccups through the wall. And me, just 16 then and ripe as a bowl of apples. Now happening upon one another again and it was just as we were as if time hadn't passed and he still took three sugars in his tea though i could tell straight away that the world had pushed him to one side as it had with me as it does with those of us born on our bones and his left hand then smoothing down his hair at the back before placing it on the man's shoulder i'm wondering he would said if you've been considering a submersible or external surface model the man looked at Selwyn as if his affair with a submersible model had just been exposed and his wife clapped her hand over her mouth and gasped that she'd not given it a thought either. There's so much to think about, she explained. It's like a whole new world. Selwyn led the distressed couple to the pond pumps where he got them to cradle each one as if choosing a newborn. 
This one was more economical and practical and likely to sleep through the night. This came with an external pressurised filter, a squawker if you like, and this one came with a removable leaf trap which clogs less often. They generally last longer and they're easier to repair and replace parts and he doesn't know about her. I kept thinking to myself, I'm going to have to explain, show him a photograph and hope he won't mind. Understand, I shall have to ask, please, you must understand. I watched the couple spend 500 quid at the till without buying a single fish. Selwyn's knack for selling you his promised version of how your world could be still terrifying. He won't understand. He will never understand. Except that's when he caught sight of me and not a bit of me. Just a, another one of those women who's standing behind you in the supermarket queue and dressed as if applying for a job in a department store that will, will let me down gently. I felt magnified. You couldn't have counted the blink between us as he swam up to me. A musty aftershave, boots lazed with military precision and that smile. God, I remember that smile. I thought only freshwater habitats could bring that sort of smile to the hoover parts of Selwyn Robbie's leathered face, flagellating moss on the manhole, a soft boiled egg. You remember me, I'd said, which wasn't the thing I wanted to say, having had so much to say over the years and thinking about this moment, should it ever happen, and practising what I would say, which would not have been, it's been so long I thought you'd have forgotten me. He dropped down on one knee and said, marry me. That was really wonderful. Thanks so much, Lee. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> and you know, um, it's not until you've mentioned that. Oh dear, technical issue. Oh, you're all right. Over, it's just a laptop. Um. It's not until you mentioned Bennett that I really started to notice it more as well. And, and not just in the kind of his exceptional use of like these odd little bits of detail that are, and, and, the, and the pacing of, of the sentences. Mm. Uh, that are funny just, just because of the words and the pacing in lots of ways as well. Mm. Um, I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about where this kind of sense of humour might come from, whether, whether indeed there's a, a sort of there's a classness about your sense of humour or your character's sense of humour, whether maybe there's a region specific element to it. I don't know. I don't know. I sense of humour. I mean, you write when you write things, you I often write them and don't think they're funny, but then I'll give them to somebody else and they'll think it's hilarious. And it, and I think there is a there is a class disparity sometimes. Uh -huh. Um because what's completely normal to me um or the way i mean i always say that you know I, you know growing up in stoke on trent i grew up with these chattering matriarchs you know all gossiping on the doorstep with the fags and um kettle always on back door always open telling stories but never about themselves you know because that would be telling um yeah. but it was the way they'd say things you know oh what, what's jen done with her hair do you like your hair like that jen you know what's made you do that and you know and they'd all kind of be chatting like that and, and if i um replicate that in my work and I give it to my agent or my publisher they'll go oh that's hilarious Lisa and I think well no it isn't that's just me on to Jen and <laughs> my nan chatting but actually when you put it down on paper there it, it, it does read quite comically but actually underneath of it is is a solid tragedy and oh, and it's yeah. that that I'm always really fascinated in that life that is not told um, and humour was always, you know, humour is used by us all, you know, I, I use humour as a self, you know, to self-efface, if you like. Hmm. Um, but I also think uh, when you're writing about dark, big, polemical subjects, to have that underlying humour makes it a little bit more palatable. Um, do, do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, yeah. and I think it works brilliantly. And I, I think you're probably selling yourself a bit short here as well because I think what it also does is add a really really gorgeous dynamic to, to yeah. the passages and to the scenes because what what you've got here in, in a kind of mu musical sense you've got this sort of slow build of uh, domestic life and these odd little witticisms and uh, mm. glorious little turns of phrase and those odd little bits of detail that make you chuckle and then it's 
And then once you get to that kind of peak of the curve, you change the octave changes in some yeah. way. And it, something very, very interesting happens to the reader's kind of attention when that when that happens as well. We suddenly yeah. go deep, don't we? We do. I mean, I don't know how. What do, what do you, um, how do you start? Because I hear the voices. <laughs> what do you, do you, uh, you know, do you hear? Do you, can you hear it first or do you visualise it or how, how does it work for you? Um, I, I suppose I hear it. I don't yeah. hear it as a kind of oral hallucination way. Yeah. But there's definitely a sense that there's, there's someone inhabiting my brain like a homunculus in some way. Yeah. 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 And yet you write with such a cacophony of voices. Do you know what I mean? And, and so, I, you know, I'm surprised you say, because I, I mean, that's what I do. I can hear my, my work always begins with a snippet of conversation. I can hear somebody mid conversation, um, you know, which was always a little bit like when my nan was alive. And that's how she used to phone me. She, you know, I used to answer the phone and she'd tell me something straight away. Not I, Elise. She'd just say, you'll never guess who's died. You know, and it, there was never any greeting or anything like that. And, and that's how I hear it. And invariably in a Stoke accent, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and and it's that what I try and capture. So all my work begins with a dialogical exchange, um, oh. and I then st maybe I should be a playwright. Maybe that's what you know. It's my I'm missing my millions as a scriptwriter. I don't know, but I start with this bit of dialogue, and then I start to grow it. You know, I start to kind of think, well, who's she talking to? And then where are they? Where's the setting? And where's this going? And, and how can, I mean, it's how I write most of my short stories. Um, the novel is a little bit different, because, but I mean, it's still quite episodic, but it's still based on those little dialogical exchanges and then growing stuff from it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, while we're on the subject of, of growing stuff, and this might come as a bit of a curveball for you, but... I remember not that long ago we had we were discussing our kind of processes around things and, and yeah. you said that you quite often use poetry and write yeah, poetry as a kind of way into characters or as a way into scenes. Yeah. Tell us more. Don't you? Don't you do that though? I mean, I, I you know, I'm not I'm not a poet. I don't have the luxury of that you have of being a poet. Um I absolutely adore poetry and I read a lot of it. Um, and I, you know, I've been the, you know, I've managed the poetry tent at the Latitude Festival for a decade. So I know a lot of poets, you know, that they, they, it's big in my life. It's, a, you know, it's really part of my life. But yet I, I won't write it. I don't know why. I've got this kind of thing <laughs> that stops me writing it. But then I, you know, I read Robin Robertson's verse novel last year and just absolutely adored it. So I think oh, maybe that's, you know, maybe I could give that a go. Um, but I read it because what I love about it is the power of the um, the sentence that Deborah Levy does it. I'm a massive fan of Deborah Levy. I think she's a her economics in a sentence and what she can do and she can pack a punch in a single sentence. I, I'm just in awe of and poets are exactly the same. Um, I love Mary Oliver. I love Rosemary Tonks. Um, you know, I love those you sort of they've always got like an underlying feminist agenda I think that you know that on the surface of the poem it's it's a very it's very beautiful it's often about setting it's often about a moment in time but actually when you read it a second and a third time that's when you start to see there's almost like a private sphere that you can kind of crawl inside and ferret yeah. to use a mess you know a, a good midlands word mm. so yeah I, I often find if I'm struggling to get somewhere I will read a bit of poetry and then come back to it um, and I love poems that I think the, the, it's the storytelling so poem poetry can have you read Greta Studdard's Lifeguard um, oh, yeah. I gave it to the poetry cohort when I first started here last year and that tells the story it, it's the way it tells the story it's like a backbone all the way through the poem and then there's all these like little vertebrae that come off that is offering theme subject context subtext and things like that so it really helps me inform my work cool. uh, uh, yeah but you don't but you don't write it and then move on no. to the bigger projects no okay no no not at all no i'm a short story writer at heart i write short stories and then i grow those short stories i think it's like at the moment i wrote a short story during lockdown i don't know what your writing's been like in lockdown but mine's been appalling it's <laughs> 
it's just not not been there at all um but i did write a short story that i i know now is not going to be a short story it's going to be a novella um because i can see how to grow it and that actually in a short story it's too condensed it's not going to work mm. um but yeah, you, you kind of get good, don't you, at knowing what 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 is what. You do, yeah. And um, I I don't. Re I mean, you're more experienced in prose than I am. Um, are there any telltale signs that be, that you know aspiring art uh, writers can can look out for on this? Because I know what you mean. I, there's a kind of gut feeling that this is going to mm. be a big poem or a, or a sequence of poems, or this yeah. is going to be a novel length piece, or, a, or it's going to be a, a short little bit of flash, and you can never. But I can never really put my pinpoint when or why I know it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I got asked, I, I was doing an interview at the weekend and somebody asked me about the ending, um, which mm. um, they said to me, you know, how do you write an ending? And I said, well, you don't write an ending. You, uh, you know, you kind of, I, I suddenly realised that I've just got to abandon it. <laughs> I can't write yeah. anymore and I just need to walk away. Um, but interestingly, with Pondweed, I wrote the ending first. So uh, I always did. knew where I was going with it. Um, and that really helped, actually. It helped focus what I was doing. But, um, yeah, it, it, sometimes I write something and I know it's exactly, it, it's a short story and I know it, that's it. It, it can be no more. Uh, I always yeah. remember writing Abdul and Abdul was very much a first draft. Um, I think I gave it a little bit of a, a polish, not much. I don't think hardly anything was was turned. And I mean, it was really banged out in responding to a, a, a refugee a refugee um, commission that I had. And then it went and got long listed for the Sunday Times. And you start to think, well, actually, um, why has that got long list for that? And then stuff that I've polished for six months makes no, you know, doesn't actually make any. Do you know what I mean? It's so how? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I knew with that story, I'd got, I'd got something. I, I think I'd nailed the. I just felt like I'd nailed the voice in that. Um, and, but there's other stories that I know that I know that even in Bill's mothers that I think, oh God, that could still do with a bit of work. <laughs> I think a lot of writers empathise with that. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't, you, you, there's nothing, you never really complete something. No, you don't. You just it's abandon just it. Abandoned, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Which uh, is not great advice, actually, I, I, I often find. But, uh, yeah. Are there, um, are there other questions, Claire? Would you like us to... There are. <laughs> I don't want to stop you. Um, there are a few questions. Um, okay, so uh, we've got, well, more of a comment really from Josiane. Um, she, she, going back to the dialect when you were first talking at the beginning of, um, of the hour, um, she says, I do think that Bella is easy to read, even if not familiar with the dialect, because the way um, you've written it, um, what I would call I dialect is easy to decipher. Um, okay. That's more, more of a comment, really, from Josiane. Um, dialect, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which, that's nice to hear. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, she did go on to say, um, Rob's book reminds her of a book she recently read by Donal Ryan, The Spinning Heart, and she wonders whether you would tend to agree with that. I don't know it, I'm afraid. Lisa was nodding. <laughs> yes, I do know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, actually, I, I hadn't really thought of that, but yes, I think it does share a little bit. Um, it's it's that straddling of social realism, and magical realism, and uh, yeah, I think of it as straddling social realism and folk horror, but I, you know. Yes, I tell you, we can bandy labels around, though, can't we? You know, we, we all that's the publishing industry. They've always got to put a moniker, haven't they, and kind of sort of brand you as something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, to both Lisa and Rob, um, how this one's from Tilly. How did you go about researching when writing your novel, specifically when writing from the perspective of characters, place, and plot? That's to both of you. Um, okay, 
my research um because i decided to have a traveling pond supply salesman uh, and a guy quite obsessed by ponds so um i used to trawl a lot of charity shops and national trust bookshops uh, which are utter treasure troves um for antiquated books on aquarium fish marine biology freshwater habitats um, and things like that and then i kept I, I was sort of like flicking through them and then i started to see their metaphorical potential um and how i could interweave it throughout the book um but i in terms of place and you know you, i think when you're you're writing about a place that's incredibly familiar to you as, as i'm sure you will agree rob um you you put so much of yourself in it don't you because you're kind of inside that place aren't you i always talk about my work as almost like fiction that faces inward which i yes. think yours does as well you know you're so immersed within that place it's not so much of having that kind of bird's eye view you're kind of just looking in that 360 periphery in a very small tight environment and just pulling from it everything that you can see here you know pulling on that emotional register that sensory register that nobody else will have that unique viewpoint because they're not there at the same time as you and so it's just it. having it's a heightened it. awareness isn't it of your own surroundings it is yeah and it's a it's um it's a romantic with a capital r approach i think yeah yeah that you, you drift into space in a kind of psychogeographic way and whether that's literally yeah. drifting or, you know, through the internet or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, mm. I think you, what you're doing in that process of walking and, and, and thinking about place on your own terms is you're absorbing all that information as well. Yes. Um, and I, was, I guess I was quite lucky here as well that I've got the sort of Black Country Living Museum on my doorstep. I've got Dudley Archives on my doorstep. Nice. Um all of my mates live in Netherton, so I yeah. just did quite a lot of research playing pool with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, just on the on the subject of, of place, as you as you just brought it up, um, this one this question is from Paul McDonald. He says, um, "I'm really enjoying the talk. Both Rob and Lisa are writers of place. Um, are there any key ways in which place signifies for each writer, perhaps?" beyond the issue of class, the black country in Rob's case, Stoke in Lisa's. Hello, Paul. It's really lovely to know that you're there. I, I love you. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I think of the black country as this kind of borderless realm, this sort of weird off kilter edge land and this in between. Uh, where no one really knows where it begins and ends and no one can really kind of mark down the, the important things that, that make it out as different to, to anywhere else. Um, and it, it's within those liminal and in-between locations that I, I kind of think that narrative and drama and poetry really lead out from. So I've got a very, very sort of romantic uh, and poet dive view of the black country really perhaps too poetic and too romantic mm. yeah. so, um stoke country i'm fascinated by stoke country because it's um it's a place made up of six towns um and has no real center to it so it it kind of makes it somehow placeless in a way because it doesn't have that kind of hub um, and you've always got kind of Hanley and Stoke arguing over which is the city centre. Um, and then you've got all these sort of six towns that used to be defined by different pot banks, Wedgwood, Minton, Spode, etc. Um, and then you take all that away and right, and you know, you'd expect that kind of blurring of territories, if, you know, of those little those towns. But actually that doesn't happen. Everybody's still quite separate. So it is, it does have this real displaced feel to, to it. Um, and yet Stoke itself, I mean, nobody really writes about Stoke and nobody has since Arnold Bennett and he was very, very romantic about it, but at the same time, couldn't wait to get the hell out. Um, but, or, you know, equally wrote most of his novels in London looking back. Um, and again, it's that perspective, isn't it? What we always have with these places and what, where, which, what vantage point we kind of come from. Um, 
but Stoke is, you know, even though it's part of the Midlands, it always feels too north for the Midlands, but it's too south for the north. Uh, you know, so it's kind of a little bit somewhere that, you know, is kind of declassified and is always passing through. You know, you kind of pass by it on the M6. Uh, you don't think of popping into Stoke for an oat cake. <laughs> You know, you, you're on your way to Manchester or you're on your way to Birmingham. Um, and, and, and it just that all, all that kind of fascinates me. You know, it's this sort of place that exists, but it, we don't go there. You know, people just don't kind of anchor it down anymore. Well, that, that kind of bring, brings me up to the next question, really, from Steve Corton. Um, he says, uh, only two black country constituencies re remained Labour at the last election. Um, is class identity waning? And if it is, will a distinct sense of geographic place dilute and, and ultimately fade? Yeah. Very interesting question. Uh, I don't know whether, I mean, class identity's changed, hasn't it? That's the thing. I mean, I don't know whether it's waning, but I think there's, there's a sense by quite a lot of the working classes that they feel abandoned by the political establishment um, and, and, and huge abandonment from uh, the Labour Party generally. Um, and I think that's that's shown quite deeply in the in the Brexit vote and, and the most recent general election. Um, it's difficult really because to kind of although there are still pockets of traditional working class nurses left. You can't really look at it in the same way as you would when you were thinking about class in the 70s, 60s, 50s. Um, because you don't, like Lisa said previously, you don't have that kind of industrial tie in the same way. So the people, the workers of Round Oak, um, the steel workers, all lived together and worked together and went to church together and went to the pub together and you don't have that kind of communal uh, sense of place anymore to, you know there, there are pockets of it you know your local pub in certain areas has, has still got that sense not not that many so I think that has a big impact I think you know the, the, you know, I mean, I was when I was growing up, I, would, I grew up in a kind of working class area, but then my dad did very, very well. Um, and, and we as a family did very well. And part of that was because we got to, you know, our family bought our council house and we, and we did really well on the back of things like that. And that, that's completely changed what working class means as well. I'm wittering now. I hope that's answered the question in some way anyway. <laughs> Uh, okay, thanks, Rob. Um, we've got one from Jackie here. She says, um, histories underpin both these novels, personal, familial, communal, regional. Imagine it's uh, 2120 and your novels are taught in a historical realism module. <laughs> uh, what, 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 what would you like the lecturer to, to teach your students about your novels? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Do you think, yeah, do you think all the pod, the ponds will have dried up in 20, <laughs> 21, 20? <laughs> They'll be synthetic ponds, won't they? <laughs> yeah, it'll be a real eco novel. Yeah, remember when we had ponds? <laughs> oh dear. Um, I think actually for me, it is it is more about not you know the importance of personal histories and and. I mean, my my story in Pondweed is about somebody who has tried to get away from her own history or knows that her own history is quite dark and troubled and damaged. But she's almost putting a brave face on it because she doesn't want it. Uh, she certainly didn't want it to affect the life of her daughter. And it's almost like if I ignore that history, then my future and my present can be completely new. Um, and so I think from, from that point of view, it is more about how we try and not be defined by our pasts. Um, which I think sometimes, you know, which I know goes against the grain with working class literature in a way. Not that I think this is a working class, a working class fiction, but um, it, you know, it is, it's, it's about a kind of understanding where your family's come from and that how you, you know, you are part of that history, but you are, you do have the ability to change and you can change history. And that's what my characters 
are trying to do, but they're worried that they've done it too late in life. Any historical realism for you, Rob? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I'd be really flattered if people thought of the book as, um, as an authentic uh, illustration of, of how life looks for people in the black country and for, yeah. for communities like Old Hill and Blackheath. Um, I'd, I'd be really honoured for, for people to think, think of my book as, 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 a, as a good example of how that looks in, in a literary way. Mm. But uh, okay. I mean, there's definitely a sense that the, 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 the story is held together by people trying to trace the origins of a story that can't properly be traced. So it echoes what you've said as well. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of about what, what, you know, what you do when history is forced upon you. Uh, or, you know, your own personal history is forced upon you that you've been running away from for 67 years. And now all of a sudden it's slap bang in your face and you don't really want it there. So you've got to address it. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of like the consequences of that. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And in my case, that, that becomes a haunting. Yeah. Which yeah. is both a pull and a, and a push away. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So hauntology then, I suppose, if that's how we could, we could sum it up, Rob, after five minutes of rambling. Yeah. Hauntology. <laughs> Personal <laughs> hauntology. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think you may have just. Uh, well, that's an Alan Bennett quote as well, isn't it? What is history? It's just one fucking thing after another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which kind of yeah comes straight out of the mouth of one of my characters, really. <laughs> okay, I think you, you you may have already sort of touched on this, Lisa. Um, this one's from Candy. She says, uh, "You mentioned the dark, big, polemical subject. Can you say what it is in Pondweed?" Uh, yeah, it's um, it's about um, retirement uh, for when you take the work out of working and um, when you find that you're in your late 60s, early 70s and you're having to, to you know, to retire. But what do you do when all you've known is work um, and what is out there for you? Um, and so it is, a, you know, it does have that undercurrent all the way through it. Um, and, you know, Selwyn's had this little, he, he's seen this little glint of opportunity um, and he's wanted that little bit more. So, you know, and it, it's about that, you know, that idea that you've worked all your life and you want that little bit more at the end of it. Um, and the fact that it's not always there for everybody because of the way poli you know, policies take things from us. Great, thanks Thanks for that. I think that answers, answers that question, Candy. Um, this one's from Donna. This is to Lisa. Uh, have you got any disappointing heirlooms? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, th that's from the book at one point, Selwyn, so you know, she says, he looks at me like I'm a disappointing heirloom. Um, yeah, I do. Um, my nan used to um, always give me stuff before she died. <laughs> she, used to, oh, she used to say, I'll leave you that in my will. Um, and she gave me, this one day she gave me a silver toffee hammer. Um, don't ask me why. And she says, you, you know, you can have this, Arlise. It's, uh, I've had this for years, but it's 50 years. I've still got it. I don't throw it away. She'll haunt me if I ever do anything with it. But yeah, I have a silver toffee. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay, uh, last question then now. Um, this one's from Gabby. Uh, she says, is there a danger when writing in and about a specific place even if it's not very well defined, that readers from other places read the characters a bit like exhibits in a zoo. Ooh, I see what you mean, like the goldfish bowl on the working class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, um, I think it's a negotiation, isn't it, Rob? It's it's kind of what I you know. I mean, I 
I have a bit, I mean, it's it's not for now, but I do have a little bit of an issue with George Orwell because I think he has that Orwellian tourist lens. You know, he's he's forever shooting by. You know, he's passing by, he's passing by, he's on his way to somewhere else, so, you know. Um, and so the observation is always from a distance. Um, and that, for me, makes that more goldfish bowl. As much as he's trying to highlight and, and produce a manifesto and... Um, you know, the, the whole thing was a, poli you know, he wrote incredibly politically to highlight all these, all these situations, these, you know, awful situations, but he did it from such a distance. And so it does become a bit of a goldfish bowl. But if you can get inside that goldfish bowl and allow those characters to look back at you, <laughs> then um, that's the way to do it. You're kind of inverting the perspective. So it, the, the onus then becomes on the reader. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's uh, almost verbatim what I was going to say. Um, yeah, it's about, <laughs> it's, uh, it's about getting inside. I think yeah. that, that's, that's the key. And, 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 and getting inside as deeply as you possibly can, both in the sense of place and yes. in, in the people that populate it. Um, yes. And I hope that that's what's happened. It's certainly what Lisa does. And I hope that's what's happened in Bella as well, that, you know, these these people might be kind of rough and ready in, in some cases, but they, they will surprise you as well. Mm, yeah. Yes, that, yes. So, yeah. Oh, I think we've lost you a bit, Rob. I've, I've finished talking. Oh, yeah, no, we, we've got you back. You, you're back. You're back in the room. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> um, well, um, that's all the questions. I don't know if you've got anything else to add, both? No. <laughs> no, just thanks for having us, Claire. Um, this is my, my first arts fest. So, uh, first thank, of many. You much, thank you very much uh, for um, yeah, inviting us along. It's, uh, I hope it's been of use and interest to people. And, uh, you know, you thought that you weren't going to last the hour, but we've gone over, so. Oh, well, there we go. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good sign. <laughs> Thanks, Bo. Thanks so much. And, um, and no problem. perhaps we'll catch up again um, soon and see where you are with your careers and next books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What are you yeah. working on now? Oh, your ebook's available, isn't it? For free, Rob. Is that right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, you can get copies of Bella for uh, e, e copies of Bella for free uh, oh, wow. uh, at the moment. So uh, have a look on the uh, University of Wolverhampton news website, and lots of details can be found there. On oh, fantastic! Okay, that's great. Thanks for that. Great, you have to pay for mine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh Thank you. I'll be downloading that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks both. Um, we better go because I'm, I'm just I'm just yeah. watching the time. Um, well, thanks very much, Claire. Thank you. No, thank you, and um, and thanks for all your questions, everyone. Um, thanks. Uh, I hope that you can join us tomorrow for our next um, Arts Fest online event. It will be at five pm with Dr. Louise Fenton and the story of the witchcraft puppet. So that proves to be very interesting. I hope to see you there. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.